I've certainly had tough moments in my career along the way, whether it's uh, clinical, whether it's personal, whether it's academic. You don't let your career change who you are. You let who you are change your career. I'm learning every day, but I'm not only learning about the, the concept of biobanking and genomics, I'm learning about the power of community voice. I'm learning about the wisdom of elders. I'm just so lucky to be a part of it. As a country that strives for a universal healthcare system, we also need to strive for equity within research. If we're doing research and we believe that it truly has an impact, that it will make a difference, that it will change the lives of Canadians, every Canadian deserves access to that tool, to that resource, to that research. So a lot of my work is in, well, Indigenous, Indigenous health and the disparities there. And we have to decide at what speed are we going to say that this is good, we're breaking down barriers, or at what point do you just say this is absolutely unacceptable and address it um, head on. When I'm introduced at different events or talks, or uh, people always bring up the fact it seems like that, you know, you're the first female First Nations student to graduate from UBC or the first female First Nations general surgeon in Canada. And they bring up these and very few people actually take the time to take a step back and, and contemplate that it is a double-edged sword. Um, how I look at it is when I graduated from medical school, so did everyone else in my class. We took the same courses, we took the same tests. I'm no different than any of them, no more special. But I was First Nations, so all of this sort of attention sort of came. Um, yet at the same time, not too many people took a step back to kind of say, wait a second, I was 1997 and you're the first? It's not so much what I did, but what our country hasn't done that should be the focus. We have to remember the history of Indigenous people in Canada and we're struggling in the healthcare world for years, decades, centuries, in terms of finding that space where it's equitable, where it's respectful, where it, an Indigenous person can walk in and feel that they can trust the Western medical paradigm. And so I think uh, we really, really, really need to make sure that uh, the Indigenous voice is at the table in this area of research um, so we don't get left behind because we're so tired of trying to catch up and justifying why we need to catch up. Finding the resources to catch up and the people who care enough to help us. Nadine has been with the, with the Northern Medical Program for, for 10 years. She's been a physician here in Northern BC. Without Nadine, the Northern Biobank would not exist. I had the opportunity to meet with, uh, with Dr. Nadine Karan. We were having coffee one day and she said, Jeff, I've got this great idea that, that I really want to run by you. After I sort of presented it to him, we were sitting at a Starbucks talking about this and he said, Nadine, that's one of the best ideas you've ever had. I'm often asked, like, what is a biobank? And so a biobank is basically a collection or a storage, like a bank stores money. But in this case, this biobank stores tissue uh, and it can be normal tissue, like blood samples, or it can be tissue from a diseased part. Like for example, if there's an abnormality in the liver and it's biopsied, then that can be also banked. But it also stores information. So it stores information about the individual where that tissue came from. Age, gender, treatments that they've had, family history, what their diagnosis is. And it's the combination of all that data and that information that researchers can tap into, put their question out, and then use those resources to find the answers to those questions. Biobanks permit research to be done to answer some questions about diseases. Everything from what causes diseases, who's at risk, who should be screened or tested for diseases before they even occur, how we treat the diseases. And our knowledge of how human biology works is rapidly changing. So the utility of the biobank 
is not restricted to what we might do with it today. It's necessary and essential for many of the things that we do today, but there will be a whole scope of questions that we don't even comprehend yet that will rely on access to human tissues. That is the fundamental thing that we need to have in order to do science now and in order to imagine the science of the future. In the future, if we want to identify biospecimens for someone who's had breast cancer or colon cancer, whatever it is that's banked, we're able to find it, not based on a particular individual, but based on a particular disease. We are now in a position to make important discoveries to improve the human condition. If we don't do it now, it's opportunity lost. Systematic genome analysis is going to fundamentally impact our ability to manage cancer care in the province of BC. It's at a point now where creating a biobank is still fairly novel, and especially this northern biobank, everyone's kind of wondering how is this going to turn out? How is it going to work? And they're kind of watching to see how does a community hospital create a biobank? And they're really keeping an eye on the progress of this northern biobank initiative. Northern British Columbia and pretty much uh, Northern Canada as a whole does not currently have biobanks. So although they're not a new concept at all and they've been used for decades and exponentially increasing as we delve into the world of genomics across the medical spectrum, those biobanks for the most part are really housed along the southern Canadian border in metropolitan centres where there are a lot of resources. Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, but many others. Nadine's role in the Northern Biobank Initiative is one of a founder, one of a visionary, and ultimately, I think, one who must raise the resources to make it all a reality. I've gone to conferences and seen the results of surgery using genomics and using biobanks, and that really hits home when you're looking at a diagnosis uh, on a piece of paper and you realize that there are potential answers out there. we need to be really ready to go to bat for that meeting. So this is going to be an REB that UNBC is going to look at as well. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be extremely helpful. It was the genesis of her taking her idea and then and moving it into conceptualizing it, writing, writing the grant proposal, writing the business case, and then going out and getting the funding for it for phase one and now into phase two. Phase two has two projects, two, sort of two points. One is really looking at establishing sort of the infrastructure and the, the setup of an actual biobank. The other half of it is really looking much more closely at where this is going to fit and how it was going to work for the First Nations populations in Northern British Columbia. We have the highest percentage of First Nations peoples in any of the geographic health authorities in BC. And Indigenous populations across the country generally speaking, are really isolated from many opportunities. And so the other part of the Northern Biobank Initiative is actually really taking the time to learn from the First Nation communities. We've passed a resolution with the First Nation chiefs in the Northern region of the First Nations Health Authority. So there's 54 communities and they have passed a resolution to move forward with the First Nations Biobank. I find, I think, that in the not too distant future, that biobanks are going to become so ubiquitous that everyone's going to want to start creating a biobank. And so we have a chance now to ride that wave, to be leaders in this area. It's scary because it, it, it hasn't been done before in this way. So there you go. So this is when he was, a, he was elected, right? Yeah, and he was a first Roman Catholic. I've just been so lucky with people in my life and everything from my family, to my friends, to my colleagues and mentors, to the patients who walk into my office and trust me enough to share their stories. My uh, mom is a residential school survivor, but is such an amazingly positive, intelligent, wise woman. My dad is a first generation immigrant from Italy and uh, came with nothing um, and changes the world around everyone he sees because you just can't help but smile when you're around him. Um, I have three brothers who um, they were great growing up with because they made life challenging but at the same time they surrounded me in a bubble that made me realize that um, what it feels like to be loved. 
now I'm married with a daughter. And then your whole goal, really, is as a parent, your responsibility is to make the world a better place for your daughter, your son, for your kids. And I've said it time and time again, the success is not when we say, oh, there's an Indigenous physician in this community, or guess what, there's a First Nations pharmacist in this community. The success is when people don't even notice it anymore because it is so common and it is so expected and it is so respected that it's just another physician in their community providing excellent care and they're embraced and part of the community the same way everybody else is. Because if research truly does have impact on the communities and on someone's health and on the way we treat or diagnose or screen for disease, then people should have that access and there are disparities in access to that. And that's what the Northern Biobank Initiative is intended to do.